Turning to the Witwatersrand, including the Michalisberg, the range to the north that I spoke of a short while ago, we find ourselves with this phenomenon. To the south, those rocks dip off about 30 degrees. To the north, they dip off about 30 degrees. And in the middle, there's a gap. There's no dispute that those rocks were originally horizontal layers. How did they get to be broken in the middle like that? Well, it happens that between the Witwatersrand and the Michalisberg, you will find the Halfway House Granite Dome. The Halfway House Granite Dome is a massive glob of granite which in its molten state thrust up and arched up the horizontal strata, the heat from the granite baking and converting the mud and sand deposits into hard rock, such as we've already seen. And I will show you now more information about how that happened and what it looks like in practice. In considering this section, it's important to recognize that the earth has a molten core and as shown in the image that in cases that core has thrust up to the surface and in fact on some occasions has actually broken out on the surface. What is a dome? It's a massive granite intrusion. In the photographs you'll see a few examples of granite domes and it's important to recognize that when those domes were upthrust they were clearly upthrust into surrounding material which contained them otherwise they would have flowed out horizontally and the discussion of where that material has gone will be reserved for a later section. Zooming in on the Witwatersrand again, we see the pink circle or circular area representing the outcrop of the halfway house granite dome with Northcliffe on its southern boundary. Here we see roughly what that looks like. The granite dome thrusting up, bending the horizontally bedded layers containing the gold and at the same time the heat from the granite metamorphosing that into glassy quartzite. The total upthrust probably represents a vertical displacement of about seven kilometers. In considering this it's important to recognize that when uh, molten or liquid material freezes or solidifies it does so from the outside in and therefore it's reasonable to postulate that at the point in history when this happened, the earth had a much thinner crust than it has today. This is demonstrated by the example here of a body of water in a plastic vessel, uh, frozen in a refrigerator and then removed while it was freezing so that you can see the thin skin that formed. And the longer you leave it in the, in the freezer, the thicker that shell will become. And that's very much what's happening with the crust of the earth from day to day. Dr. Robert Gentry presents research that evidences that the granite rocks on the surface of the earth cooled rapidly, which is consistent with the above explanation. It's consistent with molten rock being upthrust into cold, wet material that has been deposited by cold seas and where evaporation results in rapid cooling. Many theories attempt to picture just how and when our planet was formed. But until recently, there's been little hard evidence to go by. Now, however, a new discovery has thrust before the world a revolutionary model of our origins, forcing many scientists to consider the unthinkable. The 
startling new evidence is found deep beneath the earth, below layers of sedimentary rock down in its primordial stones, the granites. There, tiny bits of radioactive matter have formed what scientists call radio halos. They've left telltale traces, creating a discolored sphere around them. Scientists can identify precisely what kind of material caused these radio halos by measuring their sizes. One U.S. scientist, Dr. Robert Gentry, has examined more than 100,000 of these phenomena. Dr. Gentry has discovered a type of radio halo that just shouldn't be there. In fact, according to every basic principle of evolutionary theory, it just can't be there. It's impossible. But after years of vigorous experimenting and testing, there is now no doubt. I have identified polonium radio halos in the Earth's basement granites from America, Canada, Scandinavia, Europe, Russia, Japan, and Madagascar. This is extraordinary because these polonium isotopes have a very fleeting existence. One type I've identified, polonium-218, occurs for only a few minutes before decaying into something else. And yet this radioactive element has imprinted its identifying halo in solid granite. In particular, in these pieces from the White Mountains in New Hampshire and from Neiji in Japan. In granite, halos are found in this dark mineral called mica. The mica must be thinly sliced or peeled with tape and then mounted on a glass slide before halos can be observed. Animation helps us to understand the origin of the three-ring polonium-218 halo now seen under the microscope. The three sunburst patterns shooting out from the tiny center represent three different energy nuclear particles that were successively ejected from three different isotopes of polonium encased within the tiny center. The accumulated effects of millions of such particles discolored the mineral around the center, thus producing three microscopic sized concentric colored spheres. In the mineral, the halo is always three-dimensional. Under the microscope, however, it looks flat. By taking a thin slice of the mineral through the center, we have effectively cut off the top and the bottom of the spheres and are thus left to view the halo as a series of three concentric rings under the microscope, as is illustrated in this animation sequence. According to all present scientific theories, granites, such as this specimen from Pikes Peak in Colorado, originated in a molten state, cooled, crystallized, and hardened over millions of years deep in the earth, but if that's the case, the radioactivity produced by polonium would never have been captured. It would have decayed away long before the rock solidified. The grains of polonium that made these radio halos were embedded deep in the granite. The element was there somehow when the rock was formed, but it could only form its radio halo after the rock had already hardened. And if polonium exists for only a few seconds or minutes, the implication has stunned all those who are willing to listen. Polonium radio halos indicate that the Earth's foundation rocks, the granites, were formed almost instantly. In fact, they are evidence that the granites had to be formed instantly. Scientifically, they cannot be accounted for in any other way. Returning to South Africa, we find that around the halfway house dome, we find 30 degree slopes. Northcliffe dipping 30 degrees to the south. The Machadisberg in the north dipping 30 degrees to the north. And on the west, in Klerfendal, dipping 30 degrees to the west. What you have just seen is the shattering or breaking of a ceramic tile which is of similar hardness to the quartzite rock of the Witwatersrand. It will be apparent from that example that the rock was not formed in its uh, quartzite state at the time that the dome upthrust, otherwise there would have been massive shattering. We see the same with the thin slab of ice. Okay. 
with thicker ice, it doesn't break at all. And so if the depth of the sedimentary rocks in a solid quartzite state had been significant, they would have just been upthrust as slabs and the edges would have broken away. Okay. The alternative is that the rock would have cracked open, but if that was so, the cracks would have opened up and mining would be impossible because of the fractured nature. So again, it is apparent that the rock did not crack uh, as the dome thrust up. Here we see another photo of the same piece of uh, curved wood showing how the cracks open up. Conversely, using a piece of window putty, it is apparent that it is easy for soft, newly deposited sand and mud to conform to the shape of the dome. Here we see the same window putty turned on upside down to more accurately or more easily evidence the curved shape that has been taken on. So the quartzite is evidence of intense heat. The ceramic tile is fired in an oven at considerable temperature. And so it must be that the quartzite rock was also subject to considerable temperature. But then we find that following the formation of the dome, the dome itself is intersected with dikes and faults. At the bottom of the screen we see the Rand Park Ridge Mylonite Dike, which is a substantial intrusion of other rock into the granite. On the left we find dolerite near that. And throughout the dome there are intrusions of dolerite and mylonite and other rocks and faulting indicating that not only was there massive disruption at the time that the dome intruded, but after the formation of the dome, there was further massive surface disruption. The scale is huge, about 50 kilometers in diameter at the surface. The vertical displacement of the top of the dome is at least 7,000 meters, based on the lowest levels of the gold-bearing ore, and it could be considerably more. The sedimentary deposits were converted to extremely hard, vitreous ceramic quartzite. And this had to happen quickly before the granite solidified or froze. The disruption of the surface of the earth is staggering. How could something like this happen? Will it happen again? <laughs>